This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Well, let's get to work here. Uh, we uh, had started talking some uh, yesterday about uh, some issues of Christology, and I thought we would uh, carry on with that a bit more today. Uh, as I was thinking about the matters we're going to talk about now, and it, it does flow out of what we were discussing yesterday, I think. Uh, I tried to put myself back again in, in my own shoes uh, 30-something years ago and thinking the way I thought and the way that many of our friends today still think about some of these issues about Jesus. And just thinking about from a practical standpoint then, uh, what can we do that might help? So uh, today's outline uh, uh, takes up this issue, did Jesus have to be God? because that seems to be a, a real central issue in the minds of so many people about this. He had to be God. Uh, yesterday morning we said, I'm not sure whether we try to come up with these reasons. He had to be God because we decided he was God, so now we've got to find some reasons why he would be. Or we're just confused about what was going on with Jesus, and from that we decide, well, he had to be God then. Uh, maybe it's some of both. Today I, I want us to look at this and... Uh, uh, the thought really might be expressed, he had to be God. Maybe we would say he had to be a God-man because somehow intuitively our friends, people, know he was a man. And the Bible just says that too many times, you can't escape it. So we have to hang on to that part of it. But also, he must also had to have been God. So we come up with this, uh, this language, he had to be then a God-man in order to do the things he did. Ever heard that line of thought? Of course, it's, it's, this is, this is uh, a popular way of thinking. I don't think it's a Bible way of thinking. And the objective of our session today is to find ways to help our friends to uh, maybe grasp that it's not really a Bible way of thinking. Did you know that, that uh, error can seem very comfortable to us and the truth can seem very... Uh, uncomfortable to us if we're accustomed to the error and not accustomed to the truth. So I think uh, what we have to do as people is uh, learn to shift those, those emotional bases in our, in our lives and our minds to be able to come to the place of where that really the truth according to the Bible is what we come to feel comfortable with and familiar with. And the error then begins to seem foreign to us or odd. So the, the idea is that Jesus had to be God to do the things that he did. We mentioned yesterday morning, though, that uh, there's a lot of language that has come to uh, uh, express this idea that's not at all scriptural language. Uh, God-man, for some people, uh, it, if you point that out to them, that that, that phrase, that, uh, that language is not in the Bible, God-man, then they've never... They're not aware that it's not in the Bible. Just assume it would be. Uh, two natures, same, same thing. Dual nature, okay. Fully God and fully man. Uh, interestingly enough, is not uh, biblical language either, is it? So we mentioned all of that. So we, we put this at the beginning of, the, of this outline uh, just to help us to realize that when the things that we're familiar with may actually not be biblical. And we need to... Uh, to become more familiar with and more comfortable with what really is biblical in, in all these things. So we have an overarching statement that I'm mentioning here that Jesus himself made that I think uh, kind of says it all on this he had to be God matter. Okay. That is, Jesus said in John 5 and 30, and he speaks to this matter in other places as well, and he says, by myself I can do nothing. Our King James, I think, will say, of myself, I can do nothing. Well, that's interesting because notice how this reasoning is working then. Our reasoning is saying he had to be God to do what he did. But we have Jesus saying, I can't do anything of myself. Amen. Nothing. Not a as they say. So those two are not really in harmony with one another, are they? Those two ideas. So let's, we, we want to investigate then and uh, see what we can find. Here's another 
thought that, that we I was riding uh, uh, in an elevator with a very dear friend of mine one time, a devout Trinitarian, and, and uh, we were talking about Jesus. But he assured me, he said, oh, well, I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but for goodness sakes, while Jesus was on earth, he did nothing as God. And I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> he had to be God to do the things he did, but while he was here, he did nothing as God. My question then is, then why did he need to be God at all? He didn't, did he? Isn't that a, an interesting point? So those two thoughts we might keep in mind as we go along. One is that uh, uh, Jesus himself uh, says that he could do nothing of himself. And, uh, and then the idea that uh, he didn't do anything as God on earth is actually a contrary idea to the basic premise he had to be God. So it doesn't work. So I thought we might look at some of the more common or popular ideas that I've run into, and probably you have too, that causes people to think, well, he really did need to be God to do that. He had to be God. He couldn't have done it as a, as a, as a man. And so we're tr looking at these ideas saying, okay, so what was going on? Was it Jesus as a God-man doing these things? Was that what we have to conclude from the things that he did? Or is it, as I'm saying in our, uh, our overriding uh, statement at the beginning of this paper, it didn't take a God-man. It took God and a man to do all the things that Jesus did. Does that make sense? I think it does. And I think it will as we look at, at the scripture. Here's one of, the, one of the number one reasons that I've run into, and I think this is a, an easy one for our friends to begin to, to understand with us. And that is uh, that he had to be a God-man to do the miracles that he did. The amazing, wonderful miracles that he did. And, and I've had folks to tell me that. He, he couldn't possibly have done those things unless he was God. But uh, we don't want to overlook uh, the obvious. And the obvious in this case is there's not a single scripture in all our Bible that says that Jesus' doing of miracles proved that he was God or showed that he had to be God. The Bible doesn't actually say it, does it? That's something that we're imposing on the Bible in, in our thoughts. So never overlook the obvious. Never overlook the obvious. When, when people are saying things, we have to ask ourselves, yes, but does the Bible say that? And if it doesn't, then maybe there's a problem here. We need to uh, investigate. So, uh, so the no scripture said it. What about the other idea? No scripture said he had to be a God man to do the miracles he did. It, what about our idea? The other one that says, oh, it took God and a man to do all these things. A willing man. A humble man. A man who was willing to subject himself always to God. That's, what about that? Well, that does seem to be in the scriptures, doesn't it? There it is. And, and I still remember some of the first times I, I was reading some of these scriptures and how illuminating it was to me to realize that uh, Jesus wasn't a God man doing these things. He was a man subjecting himself to his Father, to God. So uh, in John 3 and 2, I, I just like this thought, uh, we learned that Jesus did miracles because God was with him. Not he was God, but God was with him. And uh, this is the case where Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, remember? And he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these miracles that you're doing unless he's God. No, well, no. That's not what it says, is it? No one can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. Wow. Nicodemus was right, wasn't he? Jesus doesn't correct him at all. Now, Nicodemus blunders along in some other matters, and Jesus corrects him along the way. But on this one, Jesus doesn't say, Oh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you know so little. <laughs> It's not a matter of God being with me. I do these things because I am God Almighty. He, he doesn't say that, does he? What Nicodemus said in that point was right. Jesus was able to do the miracles he did because God was with him. Jesus' disciples 
Peter, uh, I'm, I'm noting in Acts 2.22, is, is going to convey the same thing to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. There's no reason to hide anything now, right? He's already been taken up into heaven and seated at the right hand of God. If he really is God, then Peter doesn't have to hide that fact now. But no, Peter is saying in Acts 2.22, you men of Israel, hear this. Listen, Jesus of Nazareth, this, this person here, you know about him. He went about and he was doing all these wonderful things. He did miracles and wonders and all that. Why? Because God was with him. God did these things through him. Wow. And then in Acts 10 and verse 38, Peter at the household of Cornelius is telling those good Gentile folks the same thing about Jesus. Well, for goodness sakes, if Jesus was God Almighty, why wasn't Peter on the day of Pentecost to these many thousands of Jews declaring that to them. He went about, he did all these wonderful things as God. No, because God was with him. Yes, please. Dan, this would be just almost identical to Moses saying, Behold the salvation of the Lord, of the Lord God Almighty, and then the miracle happens. Absolutely. And so if Moses did it, Elijah did it, God yes. was working through them. Yes. Well, and that's another point I think we're thinking about too. Even Jesus' disciples, his apostles and others did miraculous, wonderful, amazing things. Raised the dead, other things. And how did they do that? Did that make them God? If they weren't doing quite as great of miracles as Jesus, did it make them part sort of God? To some extent, God, you know, what, what are we saying here? So how did, uh, you know, someone said, well, but Jesus walked on water. I know. Yes, he did. And Moses parted the sea, for goodness sake. The water rushed back at the, at the raising of his, of his hand. So, uh, you know, miracles in which uh, we find dominion over even nature. Moses did that. Did that make Moses God? I don't think so. It made Moses a man who was servant of God and God working for and through and in him. Jesus Christ did marvelous and amazing things. Same answer. No man can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. So what do you think on that one? What is the case? Is it he had to be a God man to do the miracles and wonderful things he did or was it it took God and a man to accomplish these great things? Ha, huh. it's, it's not too hard, is it? The next reason that I run into, and this one uh, occurs quite often, uh, I have my friends saying, yes, but he had to be God to forgive sins. Okay. Uh, have you run into that particular idea? Sure. Yeah. Wow. But actually, it's very interesting when we actually read the case in, you know, that is most often cited about this, we find that the scripture is saying that it was, or Jesus is saying, that it is the son of man. Which everybody says, that's, I would all agree that's talking about manhood here, right? Man is being a man. And it's the son of man who has authority or power, as it were, on earth to forgive sins. Jesus actually puts it that way. That you might know that this man here, me, that I have the power to forgive sins, the authority to do that, and so that it is for real. So you can read all of this in Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Luke, or Mark also, I know, uh, takes up this. But when you read it, you begin to realize, oh, for goodness sakes, it's not a God-man. It is a man who's forgiving sins. So, well, he couldn't do that. Well, actually, he could, couldn't he? <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, we said uh, yesterday that God can give power and authority to whomever he likes to do whatever it is he wants them to do. The only thing God will not do is give away himself, give away his place as God. He's not going to make somebody else God. He's not going to make someone else him, uh, in that sense. But if he wants a man to be able to forgive the sins of people, God can empower him to do it. And that's exactly what's being said in the scriptures there in Matthew 9. 
So uh, I noticed this last verse, which I, I put in your outline. But when the crowd saw this, they were all struck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Why would they say given authority like this to men? Because Jesus said it's the Son of Man who has this power. Wow. The key, text, key word there to me is given. I know John ah, like yes. 35 times says, it's given, it's given, it's set. I've been set, I've been set, I've been set. Yes, I've been yes. I've been given, I've been given, I've been given. So he did not have that authority except through the giving of the Father. Excellent. I, I like that a lot. The, uh, so when you, when you look at this, Jesus didn't have that ability or authority innately in himself says nothing about him having to be God or a God-man. The Jews are obviously misunderstanding as they frequently did. They didn't have a real good track record as theologians when it came to these things, did they? So what do you think? So, uh, so here we are. Anything God can do, he can give that right to another to do, and he often does, if he chooses to. Keep in mind, in this case, God wasn't just giving the right to forgive sins to just any old guy. This was his son, Jesus. The one whom God knew uh, a short time later is going to die for the sins of all the people. To bring about the forgiveness of sins of all the people. So Jesus is empowered as his, 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 his son, as his agent, as the agent of God in this matter, to forgive sins. But it is the man, Jesus, who does this. So ah, there it is. What about this one, number three? To rise from the dead, he had to be God. I hear that an awful lot. Do you? It's very interesting, I think. He rose from the dead. That means he had to be God. Well, for goodness sake. Well, once again, not to overlook the obvious. Can you say that? Not to overlook the obvious. Okay. No scripture ever said that. Not one scripture in all the Bible. And, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is addressed many times in the scriptures. Not one of them ever said, oh, by the way, and of course that shows he's God Almighty. That's not, that's not at all the case, is it? It's not even logical. If somebody's de <clears throat> dead, they can't do anything. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Good. Well, how, how does any, if you're really dead, then you don't raise yourself from the dead, do you? <laughs> you don't really do anything, that's right. That's right. Again, not to overlook the obvious. God is immortal. I mean, that kills that right away. Indeed. The, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in, uh, in the outline that I, I hope to raise from the dead someday. Ooh. Well, that make me God. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think it works that way. So, uh, but I, here's something that I found that can help our friends, I think, to, to think on this and maybe like to go on. Romans 10 and 9, because everyone's familiar with that. But do we ever stop and think, what about saying? That if you, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, that's great, and believe in your heart that he raised himself from the dead, you will be saved. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wait a moment. <laughs> that's not what he said, is it? But that's what we, we say, what we think. We think if he was God, then he would raise himself to the dead. It just makes sense, we think, right? But it's not the case. The scriptures repeated it. Now, it does say Jesus rose from the dead, but how he got to be risen from the dead is another matter, isn't it? He didn't raise him. If he could do nothing of himself, I would assume that really, really meant he couldn't raise himself from the dead. And if he could raise himself from the dead, he wasn't really a man, was he? Because men don't raise themselves from the dead. Wow. So I think, but here, here's this is very interesting. Not only must we recognize that it's God who raised Jesus from the dead and he didn't raise himself, but we must believe that with our hearts if we're going to be saved. According to Romans 10 and 9, a verse that all of our friends are familiar with. Often quote, so Romans 10 and 9, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Wow, I like that. So how many of you, this is, uh, and it's not necessarily wrong, but I notice around uh, the Easter season each year that if you, uh, if you go along and you observe uh, church signs, over and over again, I've seen this repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. He rose from the dead. He is risen. Uh, these things are rather oblique, though, aren't they? 
It doesn't tell us how that happened, and it doesn't tell us who's really responsible. If Jesus raised himself from the dead, then God gets no honor for that. What do you think? He, he has the honor because he did it himself. But I think it's very interesting. I have only, I think, one time for certain ever seen on a church sign about that season of the year, thanks be to God for raising our Lord Jesus from the dead. I have to say it was our own church sign that said that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so but we're working. We're doing what we can with this, right? <laughs> so uh, again, I think this is very... Uh, very easy for folks to understand if we can kind of just get pointed in the right direction. And, uh, and hopefully we can, we can help folks to kind of get going in the right direction on some of these issues. Because uh, if you begin to work your way through even a few of these things, all of a sudden this whole business, he had to be a God man or he had to be God, it all goes away and we suddenly realize this is actually a huge myth, really. Something popularly believed but not rooted in reality not grounded in reality. That's, that's a myth. So this is all myth territory, don't you think? It, we sh there's enough myths in the rest of the world. We shouldn't have to deal with it in Christianity, should we? I don't think so. Amen. Yeah. For goodness sake. All right, reason number four. And uh, I've run into this a lot. My, uh, my oneness friends, uh, and this was big for me, too. We, we really like this particular line of thought, but it works uh, for the Trinitarian person, too, uh, they think. And that is that Jesus is the image of God. So in order to be the image of God, you've got to be fully God. Isn't that interesting? Not to overlook the obvious. <laughs> okay, here we are again. Actually, the scripture does say, 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 being one example, it's not the only one, that Jesus is in fact the image of God. That's wonderful. But there is not a single scripture, not one of those or any other scripture that indicates that because he's the image of God, therefore he is God. Yet that's what people are thinking. It's what I used to think. Do by all means be patient with people because... Remember, you know, for me, I have to remember, I was there. Sure. And I remember how kind and patient God was with me to help me to come to understand these things. So as I said, uh, you know, I was sitting in my, my good oneness church Sunday after Sunday listening to wonderful oneness messages preached by really amazing oneness. I, I had the advantage of some really great oneness teachers. Really great oneness folks. Uh, but how many of you realize that it doesn't really matter how bright someone is? A, a brilliant man with a bad idea is still just a man with a bad idea. You know, and he'll use his brilliance to try to prove the bad idea. It doesn't work, does it? Wow. Okay. The, uh, I think uh, maybe it was Anthony, someone a little while back, not too long ago, was mentioning about the old statement, you know, always be preaching the gospel. If necessary, use words. <laughs> well, well, actually, uh, I, I can see some, some value in that thought. But actually, it's always necessary to use words. If, in the end result, we can preach with our lives, and that's surely true. But how many of you realize Jesus preached with his life, but he also preached through his words? And it's those words that make the, the ultimate difference, yeah. The, the, the lives we live, be, the, be wonderful lives, might still, that might still be too subtle. People aren't going to get the picture here, exactly. you know. So here's this business then about the, uh, Jesus being in the image of God. It's true. It's a wonderful statement. It's beautiful. And actually, as we've learned, actually, if he's God's image, it proves that he is not God. The image of something is not the very thing itself, right? We, we've come to understand that. So then we learn in uh, uh, Matthew 22 and 20, Jesus looks at the coin and says, whose image is this? Well, it's the image. It's a likeness. It's the representation of Caesar in that case, right? But was that actual coin? Was that Caesar himself, literally? No. So you could hold the coin up and say, who is this? You say, that's Caesar. Okay, let's hear what he has to say. Well, no, it doesn't work that way, does it? 
So we're, we're kind of speaking in shorthand, so to speak, to say that's Caesar, but what we really mean is it's an image, a likeness of Caesar. It's obviously not the real Caesar himself who's over in Rome. So uh, man uh, is in the image of God. You know, Genesis 1.27, that is the kind of language we're looking at here. That means there is a likeness of God in humanity, in mankind, in man. Okay. And that's, that's wonderful. Does that make human beings themselves God? Some people have said so. I, I don't think so. But we are in the image of God, and that still holds true. Paul says so in what? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 7. Man is in the image of God. Yeah, even in our fallen state, we still are a representation of God. Not a, not a very good one in many ways, but still we are that, in that image. Uh, I noticed this in Romans 8 and verse 29. We are to be in the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. But if we are the image of Jesus, if we're the image of, does that make us Jesus? Wow. So I think uh, the, uh, the, the thought that I had in uh, my, my one's friends often uh, said, well, it's like Jesus is a photo of God. It's like he's just a photograph of God. Okay. Then if he's a photograph of God, once again, he's not God. Think about it for a moment. Because I know, you know, I was overseas as a young fellow, and, and Sharon and I were engaged. And uh, you wanted to be able to remember her because you saw, back in those days, we didn't communicate electronically. <laughs> and you couldn't send pictures electronically over, all of that sort of thing. But I, I took a photo, of a small picture I had of her. I took it down to... Uh, this was my beloved, you understand, and just, uh, but I was going to be over there for about a year, year and a half, and uh, in Japan, and while I was there, so I took this photograph, and I took it to an artist, who was a very good artist, and he did this large photo for me, picture for me, and, uh, and painted it, and it, co it cost me a lot of money, and I was poor, <laughs> but that's how much it meant to me, because I wanted to see that. So if someone came by, they would look and they'd say, who is that? And I would say, that's, that's my beloved. I said, that's, that's Sharon, and she's back in the States, and so on. Well, so far this is working fine. That's an icon, a representation of her, a picture of her, if you will, uh, and so on. But I'm going to tell you right now, if I decided the picture really was her, you'd have a problem with me, wouldn't you? I mean, we'd know that I was getting pretty far out there about that point. You know, I'm, I'm beginning to take the picture and, and just kiss it and hold on to it and, and, you know, and hug it at night and keep it with me everywhere I go. That doesn't work that way, does it? So uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, Jesus is uh, the image of God. He's a wonderful image, the perfect image of God, if you will. That means he's not really God. But we can sure understand a lot about God by looking at him, can't we? Yeah, I like that. So reason number five that I have uh, run into and uh, that uh, people often think, well, you know, if this is the case, then he has to be God or a God man. And that is to be God's son, then he had to be God. Because, and, and doesn't the reasoning kind of work this way? Uh, you know, if you have a son, your son will be whatever you are, right? So if you're a human being, you have a human son. Well, if God, God has a son, then God has a God son. That's odd thinking, isn't it? I mean, but, but it's very common. People have been told that. So, well, okay. So sort of logically, uh, it makes sense then. But actually, it's flawed logic, isn't it? It doesn't work out in the scriptures. Again, there's no scripture in the Bible that ever said, because Jesus is God's son, therefore he is God. Not one. Yeah. So, in, in fact, yes. Uh, well, so, once again, not to overlook the obvious. No scripture actually ever said that. So I think that here we are, and uh, uh, let's think about that. Again, we mentioned this, I think, yesterday, but uh, Adam is noted as being God's son. The same relationship uh, exists between Adam and God as existed between Adam and his son, and so on down the line, right? And uh, we read about that in Luke 3.38, or we were talking about it. 
So the same relationship between uh, David and Jesse is the same relationship we find between, uh, between Adam and God. So Adam is God's son. Does that make Adam God? No. And if anybody was ever God's son, I suppose it was Adam. God made him from scratch, didn't he? Who was, who was Adam's dad? Who was his mom? When Jesus was made, God made this last Adam, a uh, beautiful, wonderful thing. God chose to make him differently. But he was made. We read that yesterday, right? Yeah. So he was made. God chose to make him uh, as a true human being, just as God chose to make Adam a true human being. Could have made these to be anything he wanted them to be, I suppose. But he made them true human beings. Jesus also had to be a true human being. When God made this true human being, Jesus, he made him by a miraculous miracle in the womb of a virgin, a woman. Isn't that beautiful? But she really was his mom. What do you think? Yeah, there's no, no question about it. Literally, she was his mom. But by miracle, who was his dad? Sure. God was. Was Mary the mother? We talked about this business yesterday a little bit. But was Mary the mother of a God nature? Or a human nature? Was Mary the mother of a human nature? And if so, what, what, I don't think she thought about that. You know, isn't it exciting? I'm going to be the mom of a, of a human nature. No, he's going to be, she's going to be the, the, the mother of a human being. Uh, here's something you might ask your friends sometimes, and it caused lights to go on. Some, uh, it did for me, I think. And you begin to realize, we say, well, you know, this, this, this man part, <laughs> we, we've divided Jesus into parts. What we do to Jesus is pretty awful, frankly. And I, I, I can't speak uh, too bad and too much because I myself was one of the doers. <laughs> I was one of those who, who did that. We divide Jesus into parts. We have the human part and we have the God part. Oh, I had to wake up one day to realize the Bible doesn't talk that way. Why am I talking that way? It makes even closer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, but isn't it interesting when we say it was 100% man and 100% God? They didn't have to say he was 100% man in the Bible because they just knew he was. He's a man. <laughs> say, are you 100% man, Jesus? Yeah, he's a, he's a, yeah, I'm 100% man. <laughs> what do you think? So, and it never said he was any part God in that sense, right? Not 100%, not 50%. He just wasn't God didn't take a God. Man, it took God and a man, remember? But what, what if we ask our friends this? Say, look, the man Christ Jesus, which they say, that is not God exactly. It's the human nature business. But if, you say, if your friend is saying, but I believe Jesus, ask him again, what, do you think Jesus was a man? Most of our folks would say, yeah, he was a man. They say, okay, then who's the man's dad? Did the man have a dad? And I think sometimes that can cause the lights to go on a little bit. The, the man, Christ Jesus, had a father. The man did. Now, here's my remaining question then. If the man, Christ Jesus, had a father, and that father was God, then isn't the man, Christ Jesus, the son of God? What do you think? Otherwise, we have the man Christ Jesus, the most unfortunate human being that ever lived. He didn't get to have a dad. He had no father. He had a mom, but no father. And there's people that actually think in those terms. So, the, the, but the man Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, the human Jesus, the 100% man thing that we're talking about, right? Supposedly. He had a father. He was proud of his father. And his father was utterly proud of him, that man, Christ Jesus. So what the things we do to Jesus are pretty awful. We think we're doing him favors. We're not doing Jesus any favors when we make him out to be God. You know, someone might meet me uh, and, uh, and, and say, I don't know if you've met uh, Dan, but he's the, uh, he's the governor of Tennessee. 
Well, <laughs> I am a number of things, but I'm not the governor of Tennessee, I can assure you. <laughs> so isn't it interesting then, has someone done me a favor at that point if they were being serious about it? Maybe they were confused. They really thought I was the governor of Tennessee. That wouldn't work well at all for me. How does that help me? So uh, now I've got people saying, well, what do you do as governor? <laughs> well, and I can say I do this and that. You know, they look, might start looking at things in my life and say, well, I guess he does that because he's the governor. I'm not the Jesus Christ is not being done any favors by anybody when we turn him into a God-man or say he's God Almighty. We have just actually done him a great disservice and we have done his father a great disservice. And one of those disservices is we have deprived this human being, Jesus, the 100% man fellow, we've deprived him of having a dad. The only human being that ever lived didn't have a father. Wow. Please. Uh, the popular effort, Dave Hunt, to, to solve the problem of the mystery is to say that Mary only provided a body, even worse than just a human Oh, my land, yes. So Mary was the mother of the body of Jesus. Oh. So really there was no body there, was there? I mean, there was a body, but there was no person there. Yeah. So she's ultimately not the mother of any person at all, only, only a body. No, well. they're, they're struggling with, these young people are struggling with this. I'd like Absolutely. to leave them of the agony of all that. Absolutely. And I think that we can, if we think in terms of, of helping folks to think about these matters. Please. You know, obviously the, the scripture is clear on Jesus being the Son of God. Yes. But even if you didn't read it with that clarity, God has given us a mind to be logical and to think things out. Sure. And no logic says you can be your father. You can be your own father. That's right. That's right. It would, it would make uh, nonsense out of all language, wouldn't it? Yeah. When you begin to say, oh, I am, I am my father. It's just, that's not a mystery. It's just a conundrum that makes no sense. You know. And we pronounced it a mystery. Ah, wow. Mystification. Is <laughs> so, but think about it. I think uh, when we realize it, we've got to realize we have done two individuals terrible disservice when we make Jesus to be God and the first person we have done a great injustice to is God because now God is not going to get the the honor for the things that he took such wonderful pleasure in doing God is the one who caused Jesus to raise from the dead but we're not going to give God the glory for that we're going to be over say, oh he raised himself because he was God now who's who's being wronged in this God is he's not receiving the honor for this wonderful thing that he did we should be rejoicing in God and thanking God that he raised Jesus from the dead and yet, uh, you may have been to some pageants and so on at that time of the year. And I, I think it's very interesting. I've never been to a pageant yet where that, in the pageant, you don't have a scene where Jesus comes busting out of the tomb. This is really wonderful. So the, the stone is rolling back. And, all, and that is true. He did come out of that tomb. But haven't we given a, uh, a missed, haven't we missed a, a rather critical link in this? Because we're not telling the public, we're just letting him come busting out. And everybody's saying, yay, God did this. He come busting out of that tomb. No. God sent angels. They rolled away. And I still say, one of the most amazed human beings that's ever lived at any moment in time was Jesus Christ when he opened his eyes in that tomb. Think about that. As he opened his eyes and said, it's all true. I'm alive. This is my father. Amen. Where would Jesus Christ be today if God had not raised him from the dead? We have a little mantra to that effect uh, back in our home church. Occasionally we just go off on that. Where would Jesus be today if God hadn't raised him from the dead? You know where I think he would be? Dead. Wow. Wow. He would still be dead. Sure. And that death was real. Of course it was. Just as real as ours. So this is, this is very powerful. So it's interesting then about this uh, uh, business that, well, if, if God was his father, then he had to be God. No, not at all. 
Not in any sense. That's not. And again, if we read the scripture, we need to get it, get it correct. When the angel, Gabriel, appeared to Mary and spoke with her about these matters, he said, this is going to happen. You're going to have a son, and the son of God is the son of Mary, right? Mary didn't about bear a body or something. Oh, that's, oh, that's horrible. Okay. I said earlier, we do a great injustice to God when we don't give uh, God credit for the things he did in Jesus. But we actually are doing terrible injustice to Jesus too. Do you think Jesus is going to be happy that we're giving him the credit that he knows belongs to his father? My father raised me from the dead is what he would be saying. What are you talking about? I didn't raise myself from the dead. He would be the, the last person to be impressed by us going around saying, oh, we're so thankful you came busting out of that tomb and just raised up from the dead and isn't that wonderful? He would be the last person to be happy about that. No, my father raised me. My father loved me. He raised me from the dead. Yeah. That's, that's also like, you know, a, a, we notice then the, uh, uh, all of this business about Jesus and his ascension which is also, we leave that kind of oblique. Uh, he ascended, he went up and so on. But how many of you know, uh, over and over again, the scriptures cast it in the passive. Actually, if you, if you check your Greek, he was taken up. He didn't just go up when he got ready. He didn't go, and when he got up there, I've said before, God even tells him where to sit. Amen. Here, sit at my right hand. <laughs> What do you think? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when uh, Mary is talking to uh, or the angel, when the angel's talking to Mary, it's interesting that the angel says it correctly. The angel says, this is going to happen to you because... The Spirit of God is going to come upon you. Now, I've always said that for uh, the, the Trinitarian perspective, we have the wrong thing happening there. We have the wrong person coming on Mary. What the angel should have said, Mary, you're going to have a son because God the Son is going to come and move into your womb and be born from you. That's not what it, We've got the wrong person. We've got God the Son coming on Mary. That's not what the angel said. The angel said, the Spirit of God himself is going to come upon Mary. The Spirit of the Father. And that's why he, that man Jesus, is the Son of God. And that's also why God is literally his Father. What do you think? Yes, please. Well, you said there, so think, but Justin Martyr in the second century said exactly that. The Holy Spirit coming over Mary was the pre-existing God the Son. Oh, really? He, yeah. he said the wrong thing. That's right. Where was yeah, going that's on right. In the second century. Well, isn't that again what uh, what we often posit at that point? We're saying, oh, yes, but but it was God the Son or the this eternal Word business and all that come, came down and and got in Mary. Well, we got the wrong person coming on Mary, according to the angel Gabriel. Of course, Gabriel may have been confused. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to go ahead and stick with Gabriel. <laughs> Hang with Gabriel in this. So, I think we have to, uh, let's just, let's take a, an overview of what we've been saying. I think that as we look at these matters, we realize that Jesus' overarching statement that I mentioned, I can do nothing of myself. He, in other scriptures, gives all the credit to his Father. In John 14, I'm not doing these things. I don't even speak the words I speak of myself. It's the Father who does these wonderful things. Wow. So, uh, I think his overarching statement, I can do nothing of himself, I think that trumps all my reasons why he had to be God in order to do stuff. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe everyone should memorize that, that scripture. And there's others that will tell us basically the same thing. But John 5 and 30, I can do nothing of myself. I don't even speak of myself. He tells me what to say. Wow. 
goodness. Also then, as we've learned, this idea, well, while he was here on earth, he didn't do anything as God, but doesn't that then nullify the whole business he had to be God to do all the stuff? Yeah. yeah. We think about that. Yeah. We also know this too, then. People are very concerned that we're going to somehow offend Jesus or offend God if we don't make Jesus to be God. Actually, the exact opposite is the case. Amen. We're going to offend God when we say that the things God has done for Jesus Christ, that Jesus did him himself. And we're going to actually offend Jesus as well. He's not happy when we're doing that. We've misappropriated our honor that should go to God. We're supposed to be standing here with Jesus, with Jesus, glorifying the God who raised him from the dead and who will raise us from the dead. What do you think? Amen. So, wow. This isn't so hard then, is it? We need to find ways, I think, to try to make these things easier for our friends to understand. And, and I think that we can. Can you say amen?